Next, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Mr. Paul Cruzculo from the Gallagher Law to the stage to introduce our next speaker. Thank you. So I have the honor of introducing our next speaker, who is an attorney, but not just any attorney. He's one of two attorneys out of over 1,200 nationwide to have two top 100 national jury verdicts between the, the years 2014 and 2016. And oh, by the way, he's the only one who's blind. He's also an entrepreneur, whereby he's a business owner, not operator, in multiple businesses, including the 100-plus uh, person law firm, Callagy Law, which operates throughout the United States. He's a philanthropist, having donated over a million dollars of his own money, and having caused in excess of $7 million. And if you consider the people he's coached and trained on sustainable giving, that, that number likely exceeds $10 million this year alone for charitable organizations throughout the world. And finally, he's a world-renowned coach, speak, speaker, trainer. He's had the honor and privilege of speaking to executives at Disney, T-Mobile, Salesforce. He spoke at the Tomorrowland Music Festival in Belgium uh, and spoke two weeks ago for the 17th time at Tony Robbins' Date with Destiny. And in fact, Tony Robbins said, and I quote, nobody leads with more heart and integrity than Sean Callagy. And if you don't know what he's up to in the world, you need to. So thank you, Law 2.0. Thank you, Money 2.0, because all of you in this room today now have an opportunity to learn what he's up to in the world. So please help me in welcoming to the stage my friend, my coach, my mentor, my partner, Mr. Sean Callagy. Hang out down here, and yes, I am blind, but I will hopefully not crash into too many things. Um, so Martin Luther King. Bill Gates, Abraham Lincoln, Oprah Winfrey, Muhammad Ali, Mickey Mouse. What do these very different people and creature have in common? What they share in common, of course, is they all possess the superpower of influence. And what is influence? Words have no meaning until we agree on what they mean even if they have uh, definitions in Webster's. So the way we're going to use the term influence is the ability to take an idea, a concept, from inside of us, our mind, our heart, our soul, and transfer it to someone else, have it received and acted upon. So when you think of Martin Luther King, I have a dream. Abraham Lincoln, four score and seven years ago. Oprah Winfrey said she held the microphone for 30,000 people because she said, I see you, I hear you, and what you say matters to me. Bill Gates walked into IBM and transformed the world of technology when he realized that if IBM said yes, then we will license something that you haven't figured out yet and do not own and buy it from you because we think the money is in the hardware, not the software, Bill Gates knew something different and caused the yes with IBM and caused yes with someone in his garage to bring that together to change the world. Muhammad Ali, in the horrific language of the 1960s, was considered to be, and I quote, mentally retarded. And Muhammad Ali went on to become the most recognizable figure on the face of the earth when he fought George Foreman running through the jungles of Zaire People in the community were chanting Ali Bumbaye, Ali Bumbaye, for Ali, kill him. As they believed in the impossible dream of Muhammad Ali beating George Foreman after he had defeated the United States government, who wanted to put him in prison for declining to fight in the Vietnam War for religious exemption. Mickey Mouse has built a kingdom and an empire. Fun fact. When Disney bought Star Wars, when the mouse bought Star Wars, Star Wars franchise is worth $4 billion. Does anyone know what the Star Wars, and, and people are like, that's crazy. How could Disney ever think, how could the mouse ever think they could make the money back for $4 billion to George Lucas? Any idea of what Star Wars is worth today, that franchise, just a, about a decade later? $70 billion is what it's worth now, the superpower of influence. So interesting, and in the you know, 27 minutes or so that we have left together, 
What are we here to do? For me to tell you some fun, dramatic stories? No, to cause positive things to be taken away today because all of this begs a very important question. Why are you here? Not just like why are you in this room, but why are you at Law 2.0? Why are you here? And I will submit that every single person is at Law 2.0. Every single person is in this room because you want more, more something. You might want more connection, friendship, love, contribution, socialization. Maybe you want more time freedom, duplication, and scaling. For some, maybe all of us at some level would appreciate more money, some maybe more than others. But we are here collectively because we want more. And what if, what if the pathway to more is paved with understanding that there is a superpower, that of integrous influence, a place to apply it and having ourselves understand how to use it, that that is literally the yellow brick road, the golden ticket, the pathway to the more we seek, whether that more is time, whether it is money, or magic, magic being the category of all of the other things combined, socialization, contribution, fundraising for charity, uh, pride, growth, adventure, exhilaration, whatever that would be, that that pathway is paved with understanding the superpower of influence how to apply it, and where to get yourself to use it. And finally, what if that is actually attainable and achievable for every single person in this room? Heck, if Muhammad Ali could do it, Mickey Mouse, Oprah Winfrey facing gender dynamics, racial bias, trauma at the most horrific of levels, creating a statistical improbability at the most infinitesimal of levels that she will become a multi-billionaire, Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King, Bill Gates, smart guy, did go to Harvard, mom was connected to IBM, but to be worth 12 figures, wait, 12? Remember when it was like, hey, wow, I'd like to make six figures. The dude is worth 12. The superpower of influence, where to apply it, how to get yourself to use it is everything, literally everything. No judgment, no assessment of where anybody would want to be because the incredible power of choice is beautiful. But I believe in this next question has great relevance as well. Who are you? Who are you? Who have you decided that you are? And who have you decided that you are not? Because that decision is affecting everything. It affects how we show up in our learning, our growth, our possibility. And these questions have sat on my heart and my soul since the earliest memories that I have. Because I watch beautiful people work hard and suffer. I watch other people seemingly not be as nearly as nice a person or kind a person, not nearly work as hard, and seem to have a lot more. And as I grew up, that didn't resonate or make sense to me. So here are our outcomes for today, and the time we have remaining, to take away three tangible things about the promise we discussed. Something to take away about the superpower of human influence, and something to take away that we shouldn't be doing with the superpower of integrous influence. Something in our what to do with it, that will be a do, something in the what to do with it, that's a do not. And finally, in our self-mastery, how we get ourselves to use it, a do and a do not. Six takeaways for today, other than the macro takeaway, of that there's a structure and a formula to create all this. Who am I? How dare I discuss these topics? What right do I have? A fair question received with great humility. Hmm, humility. An interesting question. What is humility and what is modesty? So one of the things we foundationally talk about, and I've been thinking about for two and a half decades, is this distinction of humility versus modesty. So for our languaging framework for today, we will define, I will define, you could choose to define it with me or not, it's your call, your choice. You can define any word any way you want. The beauty of being in a free country. 
Humility, as I choose and propose, I choose to define and propose to you to accept it, is that we believe we are not better and we are not less than anyone else. Humility. We are equally worthy. We are equally capable. We are equally entitled to love, to freedom, to respect, to growth, to possibility. Modesty, I define as a lie. Modesty is pretending that you are less than what you are. Hey, wow, you're a really skilled attorney. No, 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 not me. Hey, you're an incredible accountant. No, 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 not me. You're a wonderful dad, mom, aunt, uncle, brother, sister. No, 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 not me. It was so generous of you to give. No, 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 not me. Modesty. Now, why do I think this is an enormous challenge? Because how can anyone know in a capitalist structure where Peter Drucker says that everything is marketing and innovation, and all marketing is is getting our messaging out to the world, if we are falsely modest, how can we possibly connect with the people we desire most to serve and support in the world? So, who am I? Um, at five years old, my mom found out that I was going to go blind like her father. Her father, Pop, to me, was one of the closest human beings in my life, along with his wife, my grandmother, Nani. I became a Division I college athlete, believe it or not, um, because my eye condition was only slowly degenerating, and I had hoped to play professional baseball, and this came to a crashing halt after being a four-year Division I starter at Columbia University, where I was captain. The probability of me being a Division I baseball player, regardless of my eyesight, just based on my Little League performance, was an unfathomable. I have hundreds of examples in my own life of achieving outcomes and results that people literally told me were impossible, and not just because of my visual disability. By the way, I ski double black diamonds to this day. I'm actually a better skier blind, and I can't see a thing in front of me. I have a little bit of wide peripheral. I'm a better skier blind with audio assist from my son leading me down the mountain than I was when I was sighted. I ski in tropical, I mean, I'm sorry, surf in tropical storms. I scuba dive with sharks. I don't say that to be um, boastful, uh, but I'm also not falsely modest. I don't think it makes me better or less than anybody else, but I'm a stand in the world for not accepting limitation. And it's not just physically, I found this pathway through the influence, what to do with, and how you get yourself to use it. And when I came out of school, the brief thumbnail is I built a 40 person law firm quitting my job at a prestigious law firm, having no money, being $100,000 in debt, having no relationship capital, having no identity and no teammates, and I did it all so I could stand someday in front of amazing humans like yourself and either say, people in the space of personal professional development are full of it, or they're not, and they're not full of it. What is the challenge, though, is the human ego and fear, which we'll come to. So my life, and Paul, acknowledged a couple of beautiful things. I went and built a 40-person law firm. I sold it. I built a coaching and training company. I wrote 2000s. I became a certified coach in 2003 when nobody even heard of coaching uh, before everybody was a certified coach along with their uh, brother, sister, aunt, uncle. And I progressed on to building a second law firm in two years of 100 people with no equity partners in the firm except myself, generating all of the business for it. I became known to many as a great marketer but maybe not a great attorney, and then God blessed me with a miracle. He dropped two cases into my lap that were business cases, uh, both in the, you know, as the, I don't even know what you call the 2010s, the 2010s, you know, back in the day, you know, the 1900s, it was like this, these swinging teens or something. I don't know what it is, but whatever it was, 2010, 11, and I had two top 100 national jury verdicts. Uh, both, I had zero dollar offers. Both, we had eight-figure compensatory, eight-figure punitive damage awards using these exact same principles. My point in sharing that is, if you're listening to what I'm, I'm saying, thinking it's because I'm a lawyer, because I'm, I happen to be an attorney or practice law, that is not the case whatsoever, number one. Uh, it is not because I'm a coach. It's not because I'm a speaker. It's not because um, I'm a philanthropist. In fact, all of these things are the same thing. Our marketing, our selling, our managing, our leading, our recruiting, our fundraising for profit, not for profit, 
is all the exact same thing. It's how we go from hello to yes. Remember that idea of having influence inside of us, transferring to somebody else having received and acted upon. This is the study of my life. So when I, five years ago, decided that I would like to take this work to the world because I had the law firm and I had spent an incredible amount of time um, becoming what Paul mentioned as a business owner and an operator, where my top outcome was to serve the firm, serve clients, but to have an immense amount of free time to spend with my children. And my kids played in a thousand sporting events. I missed nine. I coached all the games, all the teams. In fact, we had a 700-person Christmas and holiday party this past Friday night, and many of the children I coached with my teammates, my children, and friends were there, now 22 years old and 23 years old, and it was a blessing and privilege to have that time in my life. And the exact same things that we did with those young people and the exact same things we did to build the law firms is now something I do on the stages like Salesforce, T-Mobile, Disney, speaking on Tony Robbins stage, creating this unblinded platform and the other things that we do because my heart hurts for people. My heart hurts for people. And my heart hurts for people because I truly believe that we have an immense amount of misunderstanding and misinformation that is incomplete when people desire to build business. Um, when I came into the law, I was told that maybe eight to 10 years down the road, I would be competent enough to go to court, litigate cases, maybe a magic wand would be waved over my head and I'd become a partner. And what I realized is, um, yeah, like 75 years ago, people became attorneys after one year of apprenticeship and then opened their own office. What changed? Well, economic oppression, that's what changed. Limitation of people, that's what changed, and I didn't want to buy into that formula, so knowing I was going blind, I didn't want to be blind and broke, so that's when I started my own law firm, and a short time later, I was litigating cases in New Jersey against some of the top commercial litigators ranked in the state by the Bar Association, and what I found was that what I understood and had trained and developed in the space of influence allowed me to not only be their equal in the courtroom, but their superior in the courtroom. That is a human being, the distinction of humility and modesty, and I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe how accessible acceleration was in short periods of time, and I couldn't believe the limited thinking of people about what was possible. And I operated outside the system. I didn't go to bar association events. I didn't go to beefsteak dinners. I didn't meet judges. I didn't know any of these people. So I also didn't know the limitations because I only worked for a big firm for six months. And it was astounding to me that I would sit in court as I was explosively growing my practice from zero to 40 people in the first two years, and I'd be sitting with hardworking, well-intentioned, good people, 20 years in practice, who were sitting reading a newspaper, remember those, and they'd be uh, saying how there's more lawyers now, and it's terrible, you can't develop any business, and they were just living in lies. Good people living in the lies that were given to them by others. So I built, I grew, I did, I had those cases, so now people consider me to be not only a great marketer, but a great attorney, which with humility, I was before that, but now I had the pedigree of ALM jury verdicts of one of only two people, Paul said 1,200, of 1 1.2 million attorneys in America to have that distinction. And then I said, hey, it's time for me to take my work to the world. But have any of you guys ever heard of that uh, dude, Rocky Balboa? You guys know Rocky? If you know Rocky, could I get a yes? Yeah, okay. So Rocky is the Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. Luke Skywalker, Daniel San from um, the Karate Kid, Mr. Miyagi. It's in every other tale is the hero's journey. So in Rocky, there's an interesting dynamic. We get so excited initially when we meet a new hero. Like everybody loved Rocky one. By Rocky two, some people are tired of the story. By Rocky Seven, mostly everyone was tired of the story. But it's the truth of life because we never arrive. And so I happen to love sequels. And I love sequels because in the hero's journey, we always forget before we go to the next level, right? The hero's journey is about how we go from where we are to believing we're something less than we are, 
to discovering that maybe we're something more than we thought than having something horrific happen and once again thinking we're less, finding ourselves and finding our way through. And for Rocky and so many other sequel stories that we would sort of scoff at, laugh at, that's what always happens. Rocky would eventually lose his guide, his manager. He had to find himself again. He would later lose his wife. He would have to find himself again. He would lose his son. He would have to find himself again. He would lose everyone and everything he loved that he felt made him him, and yet he recreated himself even in his old age. That's why, miraculously, the, the late Creed movies, people actually came back and loved. The well told hero's journey, who are you? So, let's get to a couple quick takeaways. Influence mastery, and let's throw up the full formula slide, Tink. There's process, influence, self-mastery. Influence mastery is the mechanism of how we go from hello to yes with people. The key fundamental takeaway in the very limited time that we have together is what Oprah said. Modeling is everything. So if Oprah went from this statistical improbability to being a multi-billionaire African-American woman who had been horrifically abused in her youth, I think I'll listen. And she said, it's because I see you, I hear you, and what you say matters to me. And so if we all leave every conversation, every moment with people, saying, I see you, I hear you, what you say matters to me through our listening and our acknowledgments of what we're hearing at depth, not in a how to win friends and influence people, check the box, surface level, so now I can talk about it. So people feel a way that they never feel in their life. Most humans never feel this way in their home with others. They don't feel seen, heard, and understood. They don't feel like what they say matters. They feel like they're being annoying if they say pass the salt. And if we give people this gift, what can we do for them? So, takeaway one. Leave people imprinted with that dynamic. I see you, I hear you, what you say matters to me. The don't in influence master and the going of hello yes. And by the way, in influence, we have four steps, 12 minutes spent moments, four energies, Unbelievable, beautiful mastery present. That is just a snapshot, but a vital takeaway snapshot. If we don't get that one right, nothing happens. So what's a don't? A don't is, I propose to you, right? Take what you will. Like, what if we never said, well, that's just not how I communicate. That's just not me. I don't communicate that way. I propose to you that that's a lie. I propose to you that someone taught you how to communicate. Your parents, your teachers, your coaches, your um, friends taught you what was appropriate, not appropriate. People that managed you, partners, judges, other people told you how it was okay to communicate. I had the privilege and having a top jury verdict in the past seven years in Arizona. It was in 2016, $27 million verdict. And in that case, the honorable judge, um, Jonathan Campbell, who is an absolute brilliant man, rock star, he is at one point, I'm not sure if he still is, was the head of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure Committee. And in that case, he had a court rule that said, number one, I can't do what I'm doing right now. I had to just stay on the podium. Number two, there's no emotion in his courtroom. Now, I love Judge Campbell, and he was an extraordinary judge unbiased, as clear and direct as they come, and he was wrong. Because all decisions are made based upon emotion, even by Judge Campbell. And then we logically justify them. How do I know? Because after a mere month-long trial with 40-plus witnesses in the case, on the very last day, when he said originally that the bailiff would read the verdict, he looked at the verdict and flipped through the pages, and the other side had lied continuously during this case, and we'd exposed it day after day. He looked through it all. He looked up, looked at my adversary, and said, I think I'll read this one. 
and proceeded to read it. Because he felt what was at stake for justice. Because he was emotionally connected and engaged. Everyone makes decisions emotionally. So I propose to you, what if all of our communication was about our listener, the other person, and never about any limiting belief we put upon ourselves? I'll demonstrate right now. I was scared. I was afraid of being judged. I was afraid of being myself when I took my work to the world. And I began to read, and this is just a few short years ago, books by Gary Vaynerchuk that said, shoot videos and let's get ourselves out there. So here is my horrifically limited, ego-driven first video. And I say ego-driven because I was protecting myself from feeling rejected by hiding and not transferring energy. Tink, we got it? Why not? Let's go. I hope Thanksgiving was fantastic for you and it is fun for And I will proceed from this moment. Oh, we have a tech challenge. Tink, we got to check. What's up? Okay. So I'm talking about Thanksgiving with the energy you just heard. It gets no better. It only gets worse than the three words that you just heard. And that's because, yeah. What better fun Friday could we have than the day after Thanksgiving? And it is Black Friday. If your fun is going to the malls and shopping and Stop for this. Deals, it is painful. Thank you, Tink. Painful. If you think that is painful, say yes. Yes. So this is my beginning. And I was afraid to be me. I was afraid to speak into the listening of the audience. And then I decided over time, and this is like the 26th episode in a row, I was up at 7 a.m., I was being consistent and I was being afraid. And then we had some progress. And this next video, you'll see this progress is of some of the most influential people in the space of personal development. The number one woman in banking, Chin Wei, a Harvard Law School graduate that's an executive at Citi, uh, and a whole bunch of other extraordinary human beings in the financial world, the accounting world, the legal world, and the personal development world, uh, including people that were heroes of mine, like Jay Abraham and Tony Robbins, people I, hadn't, I didn't know. In a very short period of time, this is what happened, and what I propose to you is, this is me speaking to the listening of a, an audience, and me not being ego-driven and hiding like I was in the very simple video where I said, oh, hello, welcome, this is Why Not episode number 26. Tank, hit it. Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's go! Do you have absolute certainty about how you go from hello to yes on what you're looking for? Sean is a master. He teaches, it's not just about sharing the formula with you, it's about making sure that we learn. I went from $100,000 in debt from law school to having no money and starting my own law firm on my credit card to selling it. We co-created massive victories in two unwinnable jury trials which are recognized nationally now as top 100 jury verdicts. To be even on the same track with you, who I respect and admire and love with all my heart. Never again submit. You're not better and you're not less than any human on earth. When you share with us about the unblinded process and the, the mastery sales training, I just went, wow. Sean will gain proximity to the most influential and powerful people. He will find out how he can grow their business, how he can help them personally. But the third thing that he does is the most important. Sean serves without an expectation of getting anything in return. You have very, very high performing colleagues. 22 years ago, you transformed my life as you did all these people's lives over the course of time. I couldn't be more grateful. Let's hear from Tony Robbins. I don't see him as a lawyer. And I don't see them as a blind person. Someone who has subjugated his ego, who has taught me what serving really looks like. You have this incredible ability to just have unconditional love for everyone. And that is just an incredible gift. The moment you have been waiting for. Uh, the American Blind Association is the first new face and voice of that association since Helen Keller. Formula Boy Formulas, which is exactly what I've learned from Sean. It's a language-based predictable model. We will have over 300 new sales meetings this month. This superpower in the world that is attainable for you, 
is the ability to influence people. If you believe that, say yes. yes. If you believe that, say yes. yes. Now, that is scary to show. It's scary to show because some of you oh, will not like me in my first crash. Some of you will not like me because of it. And so the takeaway lesson on that is, thank you, the takeaway lesson on that is, if your mission is to please everyone, you will never be remembered. You will never impact the people that you can impact. I am definitely not saying, thank you guys very much, I'm definitely not saying that what we want to be doing is intentionally alienating or upsetting anyone, but no matter what you do, if you grow and impact people, you will have people not like you. So maybe 10 or 20% of people don't like me because I just showed that video in the room. Not my preference. But the video also contextualizes what we're up to with a principle called social proofing. The opinions of others. Not just stated, and these aren't paid for opinions, the energy of people and presence. So as you think about what your style of communication is and who and what you are, the outcome is to decide, as we asked the outset, who are you and who are you not and why? And we'll come back to that why in final final in the next five minutes. The second principle to take away from today, besides the fact that we're communicating of I see you, I hear you, what you say matters to me, and we're not speaking our style, like we don't have a style. We have whatever we choose to develop and service the listening of the audience. The second principle is our process mastery, which is what we do. And that principle process mastery of what we do, I will give you a gigantic do. And the gigantic do is have a shared experience platform. If you do not have a shared experience platform, you have a massive leakage in the three things you need to grow and build your businesses and practices. First, you don't have a direct sourcing mechanism intentionally for clients. Second, you don't have a direct sourcing process for speaking engagements to be booked. And third, you don't have a direct sourcing mechanism for ecosystem partnerships. An ecosystem is any group of people that self-identify. And the ability to create ecosystem mergers, you saw that gentleman up there, his name is Rob Gill, who said, well, I have 300 sales meetings this month. When I met him, he had eight in financial services. He now has over 2,000 sales meetings a month. That video is a year and a half old. How could that possibly be? Because the ecosystem merged with online platforms and massive accounting platforms. Just did a press release, a company called TaxHive, that his firm created a, a partnership with. And I'm actually partnering in the company. And those things create things when you have ecosystem merging, but it all begins with having a shared experience platform. If I were to ask everybody in this room, hey, do you have a sourcing shared experience intentional platform? 90 plus percent of the people in the room would not have that. And I coached hundreds and hundreds of people directly myself, tens of thousands in bulk in asking these conversations everywhere. So few people have it. I run that shared experience platform. I ran it twice today. We have it called the Heart of Influence. And we bring people on it. We create partnerships to bring people on the show. It's six to eight people. It creates strategic partnerships for us and the people on the show in a fun, gamified way. So have a shared experience platform. Oh, like a podcast? Well, could be, but a podcast is one person at a time. Our show, we bring six to eight people at a time where everybody interacts. It's like a dinner meeting, but virtually. So it's shorter right, than dinner and more impactful because of the structure that's set up. So have a shared experience platform. A do not, with love and complete respect, do not randomly network. I've been teaching this principle for two decades. I could run through all the math with you. I could talk about it for two hours. Random networking, if you're doing it for socialization, you enjoy it, it's fun, like you know, collecting butterflies, like fishing, then enjoy random networking. I'm not ever belittling what people do for fun and enjoyment. But as a business mechanism, the great lie is like going to the Mandalay Bay uh, and playing roulette and going, I won! I can always win at roulette. No, you can't. It's statistically impossible. Random networking and compared to having a shared experience platform is statistically, like if, if the odds of roulette, depending upon one green or two greens, is somewhere in the, the 46 to 
you know, loser. The power of a shared experience platform versus the power of having random networking is in the thousand X differential. Rob Gill could not have gone from eight to 2,000 sales meetings with uh, uh, random networking. Those people in those videos were not the byproduct of any random networking, zero. So it is shared experience platform versus random networking, force multiplier in the 10, 100, 1,000 X differentials. Finally, let's get to the wrap up of why do most people do the things? And that's in the self mastery category. And the battle that exists for us all in self-mastery is our survival brain versus our higher self. Our survival brain, that devil, tells us, be safe, hide, face no failure, face no rejection. Do not listen to what this guy in black is saying. He's crazy. Don't listen. Stay safe. Be like everyone else. What if the client doesn't like it if you shoot a video? What if your client doesn't like it if you speak with energy? What if your client doesn't like it if you laugh and have fun? The higher self knows the truth. And the truth is that if you were to Google all those wonderful people we said at the outset, Martin Luther King, Oprah Winfrey, Abraham Lincoln, Mickey Mouse, Bill Gates, um, if you were to look at any of the Muhammad Ali, Helen Keller, Mother Teresa, Jesus, Muhammad, Abraham, Moses, Gandhi, Mandela, later tonight for fun, Google every one of their names and add the word fraud. And you will see endless amounts of information that's horrible at each and every one of them. Helen Keller, I was seen as the face and voice of the American Foundation for the Blind and New, Helen Keller, if you Google her, you'll have blind people say she was too deaf. She acted more like a deaf person. And then you'll have deaf people who go, no, she acted too blind. Then you'll have other people go, she wasn't really blind or deaf, she was a fraud. This is true, go read it, it's fascinating. You'll hear horrific things about everyone. So remember at the outset we asked you, who have you decided that you are? Who have you decided that who you are not? The answer to that question is vital because did you guys ever see the movie Saving Private Ryan? Anybody ever say, say yes to that? Yeah? Okay. Do you remember the very strange thing those people did in that movie in the beginning? Like they jumped off a boat into machine gun fire. It's a really strange thing to do. Like, right? Does anybody here, if you want to go run into machine gun fire, give me a yes? Why did they do that? Why did I, two months ago, not go to a South Beach yacht party, but instead jump on a plane and go to the Ukraine and have missiles fly over our head on a Sunday in Kyiv. Why would I do that? Why did Bill Gates, Muhammad Ali, Abraham Lincoln, why did all the people who've done the things, why have you done everything you've ever done? Because we, like those fine folks in Saving Private Ryan, will die for our identity. We will die for it. What we truly believe who we are, it's why parents will jump in front of cars. If a shark is coming and somebody can't swim, they'll jump in front of a shark for their child. Depending upon who people have decided that they are. So I made a decision that I am someone who causes leaders to cause leaders to cause leaders to merge ecosystems, to come together for one plus one equals a trillion relationships, or at least more than 10 and certainly more than three, meaning one plus one equals a lot more than two, to make the world an even greater place. That's why I was in the Ukraine delivering 2,500 pounds of supplies and raising millions and millions of dollars. Because that little devil told me, people are gonna make fun of you. People are gonna say you're only doing it to get attention. People are going to say all kinds of things that people did say. But the angel said, the illumination, because I'm blinded by the way, a lightning bolt, our symbol, is the loss of ignorance. It stands for illumination, said, 
Of course some people are going to say that. But how is it going to impact others? And the answer is it inspired millions and millions of dollars that otherwise wouldn't be raised. It, in a room where somebody hoped that I would raise $200,000, I raised $2.6 million in three hours from not wealthy people. Astounding realities that that little devil on my shoulder saying, hide, be small, don't get kicked out of the tribe, don't have anyone reject you, don't fail at anything, that lying little devil was silenced by knowing the truth and higher self. And that little devil never goes away. It doesn't go away for Rocky or Muhammad Ali or Mother Teresa. It will never go away for you. It doesn't go away for me. Because in fact, that devil told me I was too sick to come here today. I don't have COVID, tested negative yesterday. I was hoping I tested positive. That's crazy. Because I've worked 23 consecutive days and my lying little devil said, you're too tired. You deserve a break. You just went day after day, 23 days of working 12 to 16 hour days. And you don't even have to work anymore in your life. To serve people, to love people, you need a break, you need a rest, you need a break, you need a rest. And my higher self said, little devil, shut up. That's not who you are. Get your butt on the plane, get there, and you'll fly back. Not many people commute from New Jersey to Las Vegas. I do. And we'll head back tonight at midnight. And it's been an honor to share this space with you. And the self-mastery piece is truly decide who you are and who you are not. Just don't let anybody else do that. Certainly not me, but don't let anyone but you. And everything that Oprah did, you can do. Everything Muhammad Ali did, you can do. Rocky, you can do. Whoever tells you you can't is lying, just like they've lied to me for my entire life. So where do we go from here? If any of this resonates and you'd like to continue a conversation and meet other extraordinary lawyers, accountants, financial people, I'm lying, we're not a networking group, we're an acceleration group of creating partnership and doing things together. We're here. But that begs, of course, the question is, where is your fear stopping you? Because for most people, believe it or not, we're so afraid of even clicking a link. If you're afraid of clicking a link, say yes. Ooh, it's about, yeah, because you're like, I'm going to get sold stuff, and what's going to happen, and what's going to go on? You have immense power and ability to say no. But if anything we're talking about here resonates, then let your heart say yes. Because right now inside of everyone, in every moment of decision, is that little devil saying, hide, say no, and the other part of us saying, say yes. And I've definitely said yes to a whole bunch of things I should have said no to. There's no doubt about it. I've lost millions of dollars in my life doing very silly things, making investments that I shouldn't have made, believing in people I shouldn't have. But what I've done an incredibly good job of is saying yes. And by saying yes, I have a life that is so far beyond the dreams I could ever imagined because I rely upon my higher self constantly. And what if we all move forward that way? So we invite all of you to apply to come on our show, The Heart of Influence, because we want to build lifelong partnership. But if and only if, here's the if and only if, you allow your cynic to not show up. Your skeptic is invited, your cynic is not. The skeptic says, hey, I want to like, hmm, I want to check this out and I want to like clarify and verify. That's amazing. Our skeptic, our due diligence should always show up. Our cynic is that little devil who just says no, who sits back and says, there has to be something wrong. There must be. And here's the truth. The only thing that is ever wrong is when we allow our fear of failure and rejection to stop us doing and building the things that we know. So it has been an honor to share the space. On the screen is a link, and if you want to do more with us, and we have a Wednesdays where you can gather with all kinds of people. But most important, I'll tell you what I tell my children. Do not line up. Do not let people tell you and I mean politically, I'm neither a Republican nor a Democrat. I do not watch the news. I am informed. I don't let anybody tell me what to believe or think. If I did, I would be blind and broke. I wouldn't be here. I'd be an alcoholic, like most of the other blind people in my family. I would be making up all the reasons why blind people are treated unfairly, 
why there's no opportunity, why I am a statistic, and I'm incapable of doing anything because I can't even see a thing on the floor I trip over. But the truth is, the truth is something completely different. And we could decide and believe in whatever that truth is. You are extraordinary because you are here. And I've been to many events just like this. I'm so thankful for the privilege of your time and attention today. But don't line up. Realize that you are worthy, you are powerful, you are love, you are capable. And if we let go of judging others, let's assess behaviors. But let's let go of judgment. Watch how magnetic you become. Everyone can point fingers. Everyone can say how horrible everybody else is. I am a proponent for pointing the finger here first and consistently cleaning up my backyard and my business and my life. And by doing that, magical and beautiful things occur. I offer you to consider the same. My name is Sean Callagy. It has been an honor to share this space with you. I truly wish you the greatest blessings, the merriest of Christmas, the happiest of Hanukkah, the greatest celebration of the holiday season. I'll be in the back of the room if anyone wants to have a conversation about anything. Thank you. God bless. Appreciate you.